This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Our first speaker is Harry Markowitz, who won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1990 for his pioneering work on the theory of financial economics. Harry's autobiography essay begins as follows. I was born in Chicago in 1927, the only child of Mor Morris and Mildred Markowitz, who owned a small grocery store. We lived in a nice apartment, always had enough to eat, and I had my own room. I was never aware of the Great Depression. Lucky guy. Harry played sandlot baseball and touch football, and he played the violin in the high school, his high school orchestra. His reading graduated from comic books to popular accounts of physics and astronomy to the original works of David Hume and Charles Darwin. Harry went to college and graduate school at the University of Chicago, earning his PhD in 1954. I graduated from high school in that year. Well, <laughs> While still a graduate student, he published a, a paper in the Journal of Finance entitled Portfolio Selection, which revolution revolutionized the field of financial economics. A few years later, he expanded that work into a book, which was published in 1959. I was an economics graduate student at that time, and I can tell you that his work generated a lot of excitement. Harry has, an un has had an unusual career in that he has moved back and forth between industry and academia. Over the past 60 years, he's held research positions at five, five different co companies, including 12 years at the Rand Corporation, nine years at IBM's Watson Research Center, and 10 years at Daiwa Securities Trust Company. And he's had, held regular faculty appointments at four universities, including the Wharton School at Penn, Rutgers University, Brooke College at the City University of New York, and since 1994, UCSD, first in the economics department and since 2006 in the Rady School of Management. Given the youth of the Rady School, the value of having someone as distinguished and experienced as Harry Markowitz as a member of its relatively young faculty cannot be overstated. We are indeed honored to count Harry as one of our own. So please join me in welcoming Harry Markowitz. So I'm one of these, maybe the only one here that uh, wasn't at UCSD when they did, uh, when I made my discovery. Uh, the reason is, uh, let's see, if this thing does, this is the 50th anniversary of UCSD and the 60th anniversary of portfolio theory. <laughs> well, actually, next year is the 60th anniversary of portfolio theory. So. Uh, Let's talk about portfolio theory before 1952. That's when I published. So what happened before 1952? I've been sometimes introduced uh, by somebody saying, uh, the chairman saying, uh, uh, before 1952, uh, people didn't know they were supposed to diversify. Well, that's not correct. Uh, for example, uh, Shakespeare in his Merchant of Venice says, my ventures are not in one bottom trusted, uh, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise does not make me sad. So Shakespeare understood covariance, you know, at an intuitive level. Uh, Cap I wish I could have a Wallace Berry accent at this point. Uh, Captain Long John Silver in Treasure Island says, I puts it all away. Some here, some there, none too much anywheres by reason of suspicion. <laughs> so even a smart pi pirate knew that he, wasn't, he was supposed to diversify. Now what was lacking in 1952 was an adequate theory uh, covering the effective diversification uh, when risks are correlated and the risk return trade-off on the portfolio as a whole. So uh, we'll look at some of the literature prior to 1952. Um, there was an article that was um, listed before uh, um, called The Early History of Portfolio Theory from 
1600 to 1960. Uh, 1960 was when I, I was working at the Rand Corporation and a young man uh, knocked at my door, said, my, my name is Bill Sharp, and I also work at the Rand Corporation, and um, uh, my advisor thought you might have a suggestion uh, for a dis you know, dissertation topic. And then, uh, that was 19 and then 30 years later, uh, he and I shared a Nobel Prize, and my family was at one table at, at the Grand Hotel in Sweden, and his family was at the next hotel. So that was 1960 when he moved in. So this, uh, but, so this is from, uh, if you want more details, uh, I have two examples, two, uh, four examples in that, uh, but here I'll just tell you what Levin said, or first what William John Burr Williams said uh, prior to 1952. So this, this is the theoreticians uh, prior to 1952. So first we need some terminology. So this will be the only, there's, there's gonna be four words that I have to instruct you in. So you're gonna be in my class for the next five minutes. So. One word is semi, uh, I'm sorry, standard deviation. So that's a, a measure of how spread out a probability distribution is. Or if you keep drawing over and over, uh, uh, let's see, how spread out is. So every probability distribution has most of, uh, of the distribution between the average minus two standard deviations and the average plus two standard deviations. And if you keep drawing over and over from the same distribution, uh, if the standard deviation is uh, large, then uh, that time series will be very volatile. So sometimes in our uh, business, that's called the volatility rather than uh, standard deviation. But the statistical terms is standard deviation. Now, variance is just the square of standard deviation, and it doesn't have any intuitive concept, uh, any intuitive meaning. Um, it is not true that most of the distribution is between the average minus two variances or, and the average plus two variances. That's true of standard deviation, not variance. And the reason why we use variance is that comput computations go easy uh, more easily in terms of variance, we do our computations, get a variance, and at the last minute take a square root to get standard deviation. Now correlation is a measure of to what extent two random variables, two series, go up and down together. If they go up and down together in a perfect straight line, then the correlation is plus one. Uh, if they go down and up uh, in a, inversely in a straight line, then it's minus one. If information about one on the average doesn't tell you anything about the other, then the correlation is zero. We could say they're uncorrelated. Um, the uh, um, correlations uh, of security returns um, may be in the neighborhood of 0.25 annual returns on stocks, maybe in the order of 0.25. Correlations among indices are usually larger. So that the correlation has is between minus two one and plus one and is a measure of to what extent things go up and down together. Now covariance, uh, again, is one of these concepts like variance that has no intuitive meaning. Uh, all I can say is that the covariance between two series or two random variables is their correlation, which we've said is between minus one and plus one, times the standard deviation of the one versus the st times the standard deviation of the other. And again, computations go very easily. Relationships are very easily expressed in terms of co covariance, and, but they can be broken down that way. So those are these four c concepts we have to have. Now, uh, the importance of covariance up on top, uh, uh, you know, in covariance is important. Let me give you an extreme example. Suppose a security is likely to have a very high return, but has a small chance of going broke. Uh, is a small investment in this security a reasonably safe bet? Well, not if all the rest of the portfolio consists of similar bets, all of which they're gonna go broke at the same time. Maybe there's some, some underlying uh, technology or deci uh, legal decision or something which uh, is gonna make them all go bad at the same time. That, they, then they would have a correlation of one and that would, that would not be a well-diversified portfolio. Um, 
there is a these titles up here. The, there's something in my book, uh, Mark Witt's 1959, Chapter 5, called The Law of the Average Covariance. I usually point out to my, off, my audience that uh, Mark Witt's uh, 1959 portfolio selection uh, is available on Amazon.com and ships in 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, now, for an equal weighted portfolio, what the, the chapter three talks about the general relationship between the expected return of the portfolio and the expected return of the sec uh, securities. Uh, chapter four talks about the general relationship between the variance of the portfolio and the coral uh, the and the variances and covariances of the security. But chapter five says, well, let's try to see if we can make some sense out of this. Let's see what's happening for an equal weighted portfolio if we you know, invest uh, one over N in each of our securities, e equal weight our portfolio. And then things simplify. And uh, uh, there's something called uh, the uh, law of the average covariance. And it says for an equal weighted portfolio, as the number of securities held increases, portfolio variance always, it's a, not an empirical relationship, it's a mathematical relationship, uh, the uh, portfolio variance approaches the average covariance. So in the prior side, we told what the covariance was between two securities. If you take all the covariances of every security with every other security, add them all up, divide how, how, much, how many there are of them, uh, you know, so you've got, you just take the average of all the covariances, then the variance of the portfolio approaches the average covariance. It's not an empirical relationship, it's a mathematical relationship, which is true uh, for every, any uh, equal weighted portfolio. So a, uh, one example is if there are uncorrelated risks, then indeed the portfolio variance approaches zero. But let's take another example. Let's suppose uh, they're not uh, uncorrelated. Let's suppose that every pair has a correlation coefficient of little rho, uh, and every security has a variance of Vs. So every, so we're gonna think of having lots and lots of securities all with the same variance or standard deviation, every pair uh, with the same correlation. And uh, in that case, uh, the, uh, you know, going back to the definition of covariance, uh, we find that the variance of the portfolio approaches the correlation coefficient times the variance of the security, but we're really interested in standard deviation, so that approaches the square root. Remember, the standard deviation is the square root of variance. So that approaches the square root of the correlation times standard deviation of the security. So if correlation is, 0.25, for example, then the ratio of the standard deviation of the portfolio to that of the security is square root of 0.25 is 0.5. So let's think about that. What is that saying? That says if you could diversify among an unlimited amount of equally good securities, all with a 0.25 correlation, then the variant, then the standard deviation, the volatility of the portfolio would be a full 50% as great as if you put all your money in one, one stock. So that means that indeed diversification does reduce volatility, but it has very limited ability to do so. It has a, you know, a limited ability to do so in the face of um, a correlation. You want it less correlated, you'd rather put some money in cash or bonds or something like that. Okay, uh, most of the uh, ideas that were in Markowitz 1952 <coughs> came to me while I was uh, uh, doing research if, into the, you know, I was looking into the possibility of writing a dissertation uh, in finance using the math that I had been taught, uh, math and statistics and so on. I was reading a, a book by John uh, Burr Williams, uh, Theory of Investment Value. Uh, William said the value of the stock is the present value of its future dividends. So I thought, you know, future dividends, and the future dividends are uncertain. He must mean the expected value, you know, the average or the expected value of 
pres uh, expected present value. Of course, if one was only interested in an expected value, you can figure out that the way you maximize the expected value, I'm sorry, if you're only interested in the expected value of a security, you must be only interested in the expected value of the portfolio. And the way you maximize the expected value of a portfolio is you put all your money in the one stock that has maximum expected value. Now, I knew that, you know, you're not supposed to put all your money in one stock. Let's see where I am in, in this thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, diversification exists, it's good. I had just been reading Wiesenberger's investment companies and their portfolios. I could see that people did uh, invest in investment companies uh, because they got diversification and so on. So there was something wrong with the theory. So uh, clearly investors, uh, in investment companies seek return to avoid risk. They, uh, so let's measure, uh, you know, expect, uh, uh, return in terms of expected return and, and risk in terms of standard deviations. Uh, I had two criteria. Uh, so I was a budding young economist, so I drew a trade-off curve, a risk-return trade-off curve. Uh, it was the, world, you know, the world's first uh, uh, efficient frontier, risk-return efficient frontier right there. All of this afternoon. Uh, I was taking a course at that time by Charlie, uh, from Charlie Koopmans uh, on uh, asset allocation. Uh, he later got a uh, Nobel Prize for this work. He distinguished between efficient and inefficient uh, combinations of resources. So I had efficient portfolios and inefficient portfolios. So I, uh, in my curve, I labeled efficient, port you know, efficient portfolios, inefficient portfolios. Uh, and uh, portfolio return, I thought of the returns on securities as, as random variables. Uh, the return on the portfolio is a weighted sum of these random variables. I didn't know what the formula, I knew what the formula of a expected value of a weighted sum was, but I didn't know what the formula for the variance of a weighted sum was. So I got a book off the library shelf at the uh, business school of the University of Chicago, uh, and I looked up the formula for the variance of a weighted sum, and wow, all those covariances, and that really was the magic moment. I, uh, obviously, the variance of the portfolio depends not only on the variances, the volatility of the individual security, but to what extent the uh, go up and down together. And somebody, you know, somebody once asked me uh, in a discussion afterward, did you know you were going to get a Nobel Prize for that? I said, no, no, but I knew I was going to get a PhD, a degree for that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, later in the book, uh, Williams uh, says, uh, uh, he, he, address, he addresses the, co the question of risk and uncertainty. He says, whenever the value of a security is uncertain and has to be expressed in terms of probability, the correct value to choose is the mean value, or the average. The customary way to find the value of a risky security has always been to add a premium for risk to the pure interest rate and then use the sum as the interest rate for discounting future receipts. In the case of the bond that he's been talking about, which at 40 would yield 12% to maturity, the premium for risk is 8% when the pure interest rate is 4%. Uh, strictly speaking, however, there is no risk in buying the bond in question if its price is right. Uh, given adequate diversification gains uh, on such purchases will offset losses, losses and, the ret and a return at the pure interest rate will be obtained. Thus, the net risk turns out to be nil. To say that, the, uh, uh, that a premium of risk is needed really is an elliptical way of saying that payment for the full face, uh, face value of interest and principal is not to be expected on average. Now, so, so uh, he was, uh, in effect, using the law of large numbers, which he was assuming uncorrelated risks. He was assuming that risk would go away if you diversified enough. Now, how somebody can live through the great crash of 29 to, you know, to 33 and in 38 uh, assume uncorrelated risk, it, it is hard at this stage of the game to, to figure that out. Um, the uh, Levin's uh, 
Uh, he uh, said an examination of some 50 books and articles on investment that have appeared during the last quarter of a century show that most of them refer to the desirability of diversification. Majority, however, discuss it in general terms and do not clearly indicate why it's desirable. And then he uh, illustrates uh, uh, you know, diversification, but again, he's using the law of large numbers. And then he says, uh, uh, the assumption, quote, the assumption mentioned earlier that each security is acted upon uh, by independent causes is important, although it cannot always be met in practice. <coughs> Diversif uh, diversification among companies is in one industry uh, uh, cannot protect against unfavorable factors that may affect the whole industry. Additional diversification among industries is needed for that purpose, uh, nor can diversification among industries protect against cyclical factors uh, that may depress all industries at the same time. So uh, at an intuitive level, he understood about correlation, but it wasn't in his model. 1952, uh, Markowitz, uh, uh, I, I, I did portfolio selection. Uh, in the same year, uh, maybe within a month, uh, A.D. Roy also did what is, uh, you know, he understood covariance also. Uh, so he calls it safety first uh, and the holding of assets. Uh, my, uh, I explain the same kinds of things that I've talked about already. I'm running a lot of time, so uh, um, that was in my 1952 article, was just essentially what I, I told you. Uh, Roy uh, proposed, again, choice based on the uh, mean and variance of the portfolio as a whole, but uh, rather than giving the uh, investor a whole risk return trade-off curve, uh, he, he wanted to, he said he should pick a particular uh, portfolio, the safety first portfolio, one whose, uh, whose uh, mean return minus some disaster level was as many standard, you know, who maximizes mean minus disaster level divided by standard deviation. So he wanted to get as many standard deviations away from a disaster level as possible. So uh, why did I get a Nobel Prize and he didn't? <laughs> Well, that's the break. You win a few, you lose a few. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it wasn't really because of uh, uh, some details of what he said versus I, what I said. I think the big difference was uh, he, he did this one big contribution and never was heard again in our field, whereas I kept, you know, writing and so on and so forth. Uh, portfolio theory now is very widely used. Uh, some. Uh, uh, Quantitative managers use it at the individual uh, security level. They have to apply expected returns and covariances, and some use the factor models. And uh, uh, Robert Engel will tell you about how to get correlations and things like how they estimate fancy ways of getting correlations. Uh, more uh, commonly, uh, people use a top-down kind of analysis. They do this. Uh, uh, they select asset classes like large cap, small cap, and so on, review history, make esti forward-looking estimates, get frontiers, uh, pick out uh, uh, a portfolio on behalf, you know, maybe it's, uh, usually this is done with the help of the financial advisors. It's also done, uh, there's tri literally trillions of dollars uh, invested this way, uh, both by investing institutions and by, uh, uh, financial advisors on behalf of individuals. And um, so I must hurry on. That's just uh, one last little topic. What about 2008? I said, you know, did, did portfolio theory stop working in 2008? Uh, well, uh, well, it depends on whether you're high on the frontier or low on the frontier. It's true that all, you know, almost all asset classes lost money, but uh, uh, big cap stocks lost, you know, 37, 38 percent. Emerging market, which has a higher beta, have more volatile, they lost over 50 percent. Uh, corporate bonds lost maybe 5 percent. Government bonds went up. So if you're high on the frontier, uh, you got smashed. But on the average, over the long run, you'll do quite well. If you're lower on the frontier, you, you know, you got dented maybe. So. Uh, Portfolio theory does not promise high returns with low risk. I never said, uh, you know, I speak of a risk return trade-off. I never said, a, I spoke of risk control. I, I spoke of risk, con uh, it, it emphasized that one of the jobs of the financial advisor is not only get you an efficient combination of securities, but get you to the right point on the frontier. 
So uh, happy birthday, UCSD, uh, your 60th birthday, and happy birthday, portfolio. Th I'm sorry, happy birthday, 50th birthday of UCSD, and happy birthday, uh, portfolio theory, 60th an uh, anniversary. Thank you so much. <laughs>